what seems to be the F block actually has 15 positions, not 14 positions. Now, why would that be? Hey everyone, Professor Davis here from chemsurvival.com, the YouTube channel Chem Survival, and today we are going to answer a subscriber question. Uh, I recently received a message asking, are there any portions of the table that are not considered subtle science? Are there any positions on the table that we can't be really sure about? And the answer, of course, is yes. In fact, if you check out my video from last year on placement of hydrogen on the table, you'll see that even the simplest of all the elements still sort of defies a concrete placement in the table post that video for you at the end and in the description below. But for today, we're going to focus in instead on a different portion of the table and something called the group three debate. Now, to understand the group three debate, we're going to have to go back and look a little bit at the energy levels of atomic orbitals. So let's do a quick review on that right now. We typically see atomic orbital energy levels in a diagram like this in our chemistry textbooks, in which, of course, there are principal energy levels, for example, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on, each of which is generally higher in energy than the other. However, on closer examination, you'll notice that the subshells of each of these principal levels don't necessarily trend in the same way. The first, second, and third are generally pretty well behaved, but once we introduce the fourth energy level, we see that certain subshells of the five will fill before others of the four. Certain subshells of the six will fill before certain subshells of the four and five. And that creates a very interesting order in which as we march from left to right, top to bottom, throughout the periodic table, we see electrons filling these clouds in a relatively ordered manner. And if we predict where they're going to go based simply on the relative energies that we see in this diagram, we arrive at a trend that we call the Aufbau order, or the Aufbau principle. So if we're going strictly from what we know to be the relative energy levels of all of the subshells in a hydrogen atom, for example, we expect electrons to progressively populate these subshells. First, the 1s. Once that's filled, then the 2s. Once that's filled, then the 2p, and so on. Now, each subshell uh, can hold a different number of electrons, of course. The s subshells each can hold two. That's two electrons per orbital. The p subshell contains three orbitals that can hold six electrons. The d can hold 10, and the uh, f can hold 14. All right. So now that we've established these rules, let's go back and look at the periodic table and how this, this uh, principle and, and, and subshell structure influences the shape of the table. I'm going to slide helium over here. Now, when we do that, we get a very nice representation of the Aufbau order, the S block, right, the D block, the P block, and the F block, all nicely separated from one another and consolidated you know, within each group. And if we look at elements from the S block, for example, hydrogen, lithium, magnesium, we see that those are uh, in the process of filling an S subshell. If we look into the P block, examples like nitrogen and sulfur, we see that those are actively filling their P subshells. In the D block, let's take the example of nickel here, we have an electron configuration in which the D subshell is being actively filled. It has 8 of 10. And down in the F block, a nicely behaved element like plutonium is going to have its F subshell being filled. So in plutonium, the 5F contains 6 of 14 total electrons. So it certainly seems as though the periodic table should be this nice, highly ordered arrangement of elements based upon their electron filling in the Aufbau order. But if we look closely at most representations of the periodic table, what we notice is that what seems to be the F block actually has 15 positions, not 14 positions. Now, why would that be? Why do we have an F block that depicts 15 groups of elements when we know that there are only 14 spaces for electrons to populate those F subshells? And you'll also notice an interesting little gap. It's quite conspicuous underneath of scandium and yttrium, which would be formerly group three. Now, the reason that gap is there is because no one can seem to agree on exactly which elements to place there. Right? So let's take a look at the extremes of the F block, lanthanum and lutetium, uh, and see if we can come up with, with arguments for and against each of these. All right. Now, what's going to happen is, as we get into these higher energy levels, notice that they are very close together. So the 4F, the 5D, the 6S, all are very close in space. This energy axis is not perfectly to scale, but as you can see, they're much closer than the lower energy levels are. And so that makes them prone to anomalies in filling, where they do not obey the Aufbau order. 
So let's stick lutetium and lawrencium into that spot. See what happens, right? That seems to make a bit of sense, right? Because if we follow the periodic table from lutetium, we have elements 71, 72, 73. The trend in atomic number is preserved. But if we reset and do this again, right? Let's place lanthanum and actinium in there. Well, now we still have a preserved trend in atomic number, 55, 56, 57, then down to the F block and then back up into the D block. So each of these two groups of elements have equal claim to space three based upon their atomic number. To make things even more complicated, the electron configurations of these two elements makes it very ambiguous, which, is, which actually belongs in group three. So to do that, let's fill in the electron configuration of lutetium. So this is 71 electrons in an atom of lutetium, and we're going to populate these based upon the alpha order, observing Hund's rule and the Pauli exclusion principle. And once we've populated this entire atom, what we're going to find is that lutetium has a single 5D electron as its highest energy electron. Right? So lutetium's electron configuration has a 5D1. So the D subshell is being actively filled. It makes sense to put lutetium into the D block. But what about lanthanum? Well, if we do the same exercise for lanthanum with its 57 electrons, what we find is that the predicted electron configuration of lanthanum should have it filling its 4F subshell. There should be a single 4F electron present in a lanthanum atom. But in fact, what happens is, for reasons that are too complex to go into right now, which is really just professor speak for, I don't even fully understand why, that electron actually populates the 5D subshell, not the 4F subshell. And this has been verified scientifically. So while we have an expected electron configuration with a 4F1, what we actually find experimentally is the electron configuration has a 5D1 instead. So lanthanum is also actively filling its 5D subshell and therefore has a claim to a spot in the D block. So now we have to consider what happens when we insert each of these into the table. And to illustrate why neither one is really satisfactory solution, we want to look at the expanded version of the table. That is to say, we're going to insert the F block into the main table instead of setting it off to the bottom there. Now, if we do this in such a way that we include lutetium and lawrencium in group three, we get a pretty satisfying looking table here with all of the blocks conserved. The S, P, D, and F are all, are all consolidated. However, we put an element into the F block that we know has no 4F electrons whatsoever violating that principle. So putting lutetium into group three along with Lorentzium isn't fully satisfying. Now, what if instead we place lanthanum and actinium in that position? Now, in order to do that and preserve our atomic number trends in the table, which is crucial, what we find is that placing lanthanum and actinium into group three splits the D block and creates a tremendous eyesore that nobody wants to look at. This is hard for a chemist to look at. This beautiful arrangement of atoms somehow results in a split D block. And so that actually is not very particularly satisfying either. Now add to that the fact that because they both have very similar outer electron configurations, these two elements have quite similar chemistries as well. And so we can't even really separate them based upon that. And long story short, it's very, very difficult to make an absolute argument that Group three should contain lanthanum and actinium or lutetium and lawrencium to the point where many periodic tables simply give up and place both of those groups of elements down with the F block, leaving an empty space for the reader to make the decision for themselves. I hope you enjoyed our talk on the group three debate. Uh, post in the comments below. We'd love to hear your opinions. In the meantime, that's all for today, everyone. Professor Davis from chemsurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.